Good morning, I'm Pastor Jim Dunson at Manasquan Presbyterian Church, and I welcome you to worship on this Pentecost Sunday, May 31st, 2020. Let us come before God in our call to worship this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. When the world divides us, Holy Spirit, make us one. When the world calls us orphaned, Come, Holy Spirit, make us family. When the world leads us astray, come, Holy Spirit, call us home. Come, Holy Spirit, come, come and fill this place. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may we feel your presence this day. Holy Spirit, like the people gathered on that day of Pentecost, may you rush into our hearts and our souls. And may we be empowered by your spirit to live a life more faithful to you, our God, and proclaiming your love through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our opening song this morning is Holy God, we praise your name. Holy God, we praise your name. Lord of all, we bow before you. All on earth your scepter claim. All in heaven above adore you. Infinite your vast domain. in 
one's only one. Undivided God, we claim you and adoring men in me. While we own the mystery. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come then, let us confess our sins to the one who is faithful to forgive. Come then, let us adore the one who is mighty to save. Will you pray with me? Merciful and gracious God, our hearts cry out to you to make us whole again. Even as we celebrate that you have come to dwell within us, we have sinned against you and abandoned your commandments. We have been jealous, possessive, ambivalent, and impulsive. We have not heeded your word, and we have not cherished your covenant. Help us to glorify you in all times and in all places. As our souls thirst for your living waters, quench our needs and satisfy our love, that we may come back to you and be sent forth to fill your world with mercy and grace. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit who is at work within us. Amen. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It's a day in which we often refer to as the birth of the church, the day in which the Holy Spirit descended upon those disciples. Um, and it happened 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, and he promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. 
um, that day of Pentecost was something that we find in the Old Testament as well too, though. It would be a day in which you celebrated the first fruits of that spring harvest. And it would be a day that would come uh, 50 days after uh, following that first Sabbath uh, after Passover. Um, and Pentecost actually means 50th in that. So the day of Pentecost is, is the day in which you celebrated those, those first fruits. Um, it's interesting because Jesus said to his disciples when, when he was with them, he said that uh, just look at the fields, the, the harvest is, is ready and ripe. And you can only think of something uh, else where he was talking about the harvest of, of God's people. Uh, through the proclamation of God's love for them in the gospel. And that's exactly what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples on uh, this day of Pentecost, which we see as the birth of our church recorded in the second chapter of Acts. And I'd like to read that to you now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that uh, through your Holy Spirit uh, that we um, uh, see and understand what it is that you call us to do and to be this day. Uh, come alongside of us, uh, encourage us, comfort us, uh, but move us into those places where we are called to move, to proclaim your love, your grace, your mercy, to bring wholeness where there is brokenness in our world. May we uh, uh, do that just as these first disciples did in the story we are to read now. In Christ we pray, amen. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, I invite you now to hear the word of God. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So throughout history, there have been many people who have been um, uh, willing to uh, take up a cause, a, a cause in which they were willing to die for. And we can go back through history and see lots of different people. Um, one of them is in the history of our own church, in, in, in uh, Martin Luther, who brought to us uh, a gospel. He looked at the gospel and said, it isn't about the things that you do to, to purchase favor with God. Our salvation is by grace and grace alone. And, and that got him a lot of trouble. And he was called before court uh, at a time in which uh, people were actually being killed for what the church of the day was calling um, her heresies. And he was brought before the court and he was told to recant, to say, uh, to take back what he said about salvation by grace alone. And he was willing to die for this cause. And he said, here I stand. I, I, I can't say any more. Um, and, and he risked his life. And he actually had to flee and then go into hiding um, after, after that. There's others throughout our history. Um, Martin Luther King, Jr. And he stood for a cause that said, there is a brokenness in the world that is creating a division and an inequality between people and between races. 
and he, where, the way he described it, he says, I have a dream, and a dream of one day when, when all of us can stand together and, and be equal. And he lived his life for that cause, and he actually died uh, for that cause, uh, in giving that cause as he was assassinated. Uh, another one is Nelson Mandela, um, who was in South Africa at the time in which there were laws that uh, created on, on, on purpose what was called a separateness between the, the white people and the black people of South Africa. Uh, and it was called apartheid. Apartheid literally means apartness and apartness. And he had such a, a, uh, a passion for the cause of, of eliminating that apartness that he committed his life to it. Um, this is what Nelson Mandela said just before he was convicted. He said, ending apartheid is a cause for which I will gladly invest every day of the rest of my life and a purpose for which I am fully prepared to die. And so he was so uh, devoted to this cause of, of, of creating togetherness um, that he would spend the rest of his life working on, on eliminating apartness and would even risk his life for it, willing to die for it. So you might be saying, well, isn't this Pentecost Sunday? So what, do, what does that have to do with Pentecost? And as I look at the early church and this church that was formed in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they went forward proclaiming God's salvation in Jesus and the church grew by numbers, um, that church that came together was a church, a community of believers that came together so devoted to a cause. And they were devoted to this cause uh, and devoted to God. And that cause was to be devoted to God and to, to, to the spreading of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. What God asked this early church to do, they did. They sold their property and, and, and put it together communally. Um, they, they ate their meals together and shared their food. Uh, they were brothers and sisters in the truest sense and, and where uh, apartheid is all about apartness. This was all about unity and togetherness. This early church prayed boldly and they expected God uh, to act miraculously in, in their lives and, and they saw these things. In the early church and especially in our story today, they were so concerned with those on the outside that they risked their life to proclaim God's message of love in Christ Jesus. And, and that's exactly what happened on that first Pentecost Sunday uh, when the early church was birthed. Just 10 days prior to that, the risen Christ had spent 40 days with um, the disciples and with others. And it was on this day in which Jesus ascends into heaven. The disciples are still concerned about a brokenness that they see in the world, and they want this brokenness to come together and be restored. And so they ask Jesus, are you going to now restore, uh, restore the kingdom uh, to Israel? Um, and Jesus says, you've got it all wrong. That's not for you to ask and even for you to know. He says, but I'm going to tell you this. What will happen is, is the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Um, and, and he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. So the disciples went away and they went together and they were in prayer. They were in a room and, and in prayer and they were waiting for the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't say when the Holy Spirit would come, but it came 10 days later on the day of Pentecost when there were all of these uh, foreigners from um, all these other lands and spoke other languages and they were there in Jerusalem for the celebration, the festival of the, uh, of the first fruits. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and there was a rushing wind, and, and, and it's, the text says there's tongues of flame that were on, on them, and they burst out into the streets, and they began proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, God's love, God's salvation through Jesus, and um, it was that power of the Holy Spirit that emboldened them to go forward and to do that. I think for us it's important to remember that this first occurrences of, of tongues and speaking in other and speaking in tongues as a gift given to them, empowered by the Holy Spirit, was to get the message of salvation out into the whole world. A message of salvation that's now available to all people. Um, and, and, and with that comes 
that coming of the Holy Spirit, um, that first Pentecost, the church is, is birthed. Um, I want to just pause a moment right here to talk about the Holy Spirit a, lo- a little bit, because a lot of times when we think about the Holy Spirit, we think the Holy Spirit is, is one who just comforts us when, when we're in distress or, or encourages us when we are in times of trouble. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's um, exactly what, what Jesus was promising his disciples when he was telling them that he must go away, that he was going to uh, suffer uh, and die, um, and, and that he would go away. And he says, I'm going to go away so I can prepare a place for you. He says, but I'm also going away so that the Holy Spirit can come and, and, and come to you. Um, and, and so there's a sense of that comfort that comes. But when, it, when we see this text in this first Pentecost, it, it, it brings up images that aren't so comforting. The wind that comes roaring in, uh, tongues of fire, and uh, a bewildered and, and confused people. Um, they were bewildered, amazed, astonished. They were just, they were, didn't know what was happening. Um, and it wasn't so much that there was a, a, a comforting, but instead what was happening with the Holy Spirit was prompting the disciples to go out into the streets and, and make this very public uh, uh, proclamation or even a public scene of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And, and for them, it could be dangerous news because it was the disturbing uh, news or troubling news um, that the one whom they had put to death, Jesus, was now alive through the power of God. Um, and so it was even in that prompting from the Holy Spirit that, that, that went forward uh, that, that, that could have done that. In, in John 16, Jesus uh, talks about the Holy Spirit coming, and the word that is used in the Greek is this word right here. Um, we translate it into English, kind of becomes an English like Bible or theology word uh, called the paraclete, and the paraclete is referred back to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus uses that. Um, sometimes it's translated advocate, sometimes it's translated comforter. And, and, and Jesus says that the paraclete or the advocate comes to testify and to prompt the testimony of the disciples. This is why the, why the Holy Spirit's going to come, to testify to the truth and, and to prompt those disciples to testify as well. When we look at Jesus, it, it was his testimony to truth uh, that got him into trouble in the first place, testimony to that truth of who he was. Um, and the Holy Spirit comes now to prompt the disciples to make that same uh, disruptive, world-changing testimony uh, that calls into the value uh, of the world, calls into to, to question the values of the world. Um, for the purpose of, of, of taking this world that is broken and bringing God's wholeness to it. And, and so here what we see is um, the Holy Spirit, yes, is comforter, uh, but as much as uh, uh, someone that prompts us to do something as a comforter, the Holy Spirit is much an agitator to get us out and do something as the Holy Spirit is an advocate. Um, and that's why I think this word paraclete is a good word for the Holy Spirit. It actually, um, in the Greek, it comes from a compound word. It's two words put together, and we can look at these words. This is what it looks like in, in Greek. It's pronounced parakletos. Um, the English would look like this, para and kletos. And uh, para is a preposition uh, that means around. So if you think of our English word para, uh, perimeter, it comes from para and meter, distance, meter, and para is around, so it's the distance around, a perimeter. Um, so this means around, around, if I can write that or like, or alongside, alongside. And kletos is the word for called, to call or to invite. So when Jesus is using the word or the word that's in John for the Holy Spirit as the parakletos, one that they are to wait for, uh, the power is also one who is invited or called alongside, to be called alongside of you. So uh, the Holy Spirit is a counselor, an advocate to come alongside and defend and comfort, uh, to give encouragement 
Um, but also the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside to strengthen you for the work that is in front of you, uh, to, to give you courage, or maybe even to provoke you into action. A, a lot of times when we think of the Holy Spirit, we think um, the Holy Spirit as an answer to our problems. We're in trouble, so the Holy Spirit needs to come and, and take our trouble away. Um, but what if, and, and, and we see this in, in Acts 2, what if the Spirit's work is to create for us a, a new situation or maybe even a new problem um, to understand that we have a story to tell, and that story is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and, and to prompt us to go out and tell that story and, and to tell it in a way that translates to all of the people who are on the outside in, in, in their own dialect in the way they can understand it. We have a story to tell, and, and, and that's, that the Holy Spirit gives us this problem to, to go forward and tell that story. We have a mercy to share, um, and the Holy Spirit is there to, to prompt us into that. Um, we have love to spread. Um, our whole message is built around love. Um, and, and, and maybe just possibly the Holy Spirit is there to, to prompt us this so that we, we just can't rest until we have done so. Uh, to create in us a, a sense of a cause that we would invest every day of the rest of our life for. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. And he says, when you care for the least of these, you are caring for me. And to love one another as I have loved you. If you think about entering into that kind of work, um, it, it really can be disruptive. It can be difficult, and even at times, it can be dangerous, and we'll need help. And so Jesus sends the paraclete, the one who comes alongside us to encourage, to equip, to strengthen, to provoke, and yes, even at times to comfort us, uh, but maybe to look at that comfort in a different way, to comfort us so that we can get out there and do it all again. I think when we hear the story of this first church that was birthed in Acts chapter 2, um, uh, it, it's this community created by the power of the Holy Spirit to do just that, to go out there and to proclaim that as its, its primary cause in life and, and, and to even risk life in doing it. So can a community like that exist today? I mean, the Bible still applies to our lives. God is still sovereign. Christ has ascended and is on the throne, is king. And the Holy Spirit still comes. So yes, a community like that can exist today. And it must, because the church, this church that was birthed there, the church that is now God's chosen vehicle to go forward and proclaim God's saving message in Christ Jesus, to go forward into those places where there's brokenness and bring wholeness. To go forward to those places where there is apartness and bring togetherness. To go forward to those places where there's division from whatever it is that caused it and, 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 and bring uh, uh, that, wipe that division away. Because the church, as described in Acts 2, the church that God calls us to be today is the hope of the world. And, and, and God is, is calling you to be transformed. But not just to be transformed and stop there, but to go forward and be a transformed transformer that goes out into the world. So he's saying, you, church, transformed by the gospel of Jesus, by God's love and grace, are to go now and share that grace, mercy, love, and to be the hope of the world. We can see where our world needs much hope today. There's a lot of different things. Not only are we battling um, the coronavirus, um, that's one thing, but we just see over and over again and month to month brokenness and brokenness and brokenness in stories in the world. Um, there's a story this week that, that came out. Um, I, I received a, a uh, message from a member of the church, and this member had asked me to, to talk about this. 
And uh, at first I wasn't going to talk about it, but as I began to study through this message today, I, I thought this message, it fits. It fits with this. It fits in all these places where, um, where we're trying to break down that brokenness, what Nelson Mandela was trying to break down and committed his life to, what Martin Luther King Jr. did, um, and, and everyone else that stood for this great cause. It's standing for the same thing, the unity that God is calling us to, to go forward, to share his love and grace and mercy. Um, and, and what this person was so uh, upset about was the death of George Floyd. And he was the man who, who died in, in Minneapolis. And I didn't want to talk about it because I didn't want it to be political or different things. But I'll tell you one thing that I can talk about. Um, uh, it's a tragic death. Um, and, it's, and, and it's something that shows there's a brokenness in our world. And there's division. Um, and, and oftentimes, the way we want to, 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 to combat that is through, through hate and, and different things like that. And that'll never transform the world. That isn't God's plan for transforming the world that we see in Acts chapter 2. And, and, and through the week as it progressed, we saw different things and riots and, and other people who have actually uh, uh, died because of this in the riots. And it's heartbreaking to say the least. There is a brokenness and there is a transformation that needs to take place. And so the question is, what is that transformation? How can we enter into that? What does God call us to do? What does Acts chapter 2 and the church in Acts chapter 2 tell us how to do this? We're to be the hope of the world, to go forward, empowered by the Holy Spirit who comes alongside of us to give us this power to prompt us to do this, encourages us to do this, to be transformed ourselves and to transform the world. Because there's only one power on earth that can turn a hate-filled heart into a loving heart. And there's only one power on earth that can turn a greedy heart to a generous heart or a selfish heart to a serving heart. There's only one power that can do it. And it's the power of the transforming love of Jesus Christ which has been given to the church. And it's been given to the church as stewards. We're stewards of this transforming love of Jesus Christ and the story that we have to tell. And, and I've, I firmly believe it's through the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit that we can go forward, encourage, and, and commit to a cause like this to transform this broken world. Um, to transform it with God's love and grace and mercy through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus. And that's what we are to do. It's going to take people in this church here. It's going to take people in the church down the street, the church across the country, and the church around the world who are filled with this overflowing uh, love of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the message of Christ's love and a conviction it says, here is a cause that I will gladly invest every day of my life for which I am fully prepared to die. And we are not just transformed, but we are transformed transformers. The local church is the hope of the world. If we believe this, I mean really believe this, then we would see the church the Acts 2 church as the most important thing. And when you're part of a church as in Acts 2, empowered by the Holy Spirit who has come alongside of you, you can say, I am part of something the future of the world depends on. And it's my empowerment through the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel that I'm committed to. Jesus' last words to his disciples ten days before the Holy Spirit came upon them. He tells them that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses to me to the ends of the earth. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the day of Pentecost, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit especially thank you for Christ Jesus and, and your love for us in him. May we um, not just rest in that love, 
uh, and take it as something that we can own, but take this filled with your Holy Spirit and go forward and, and, and proclaim and communicate. Let us allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and let us be drawn closer to our Heavenly Father through the beautiful Spirit that He gives us. I can't say enough about the generosity of the members of this church and the friends of this church in your continued financial support of the ministry. Um, it's hard to believe that it is now about two and a half months since we have been able to gather together here in worship. And we hope, and it looks like that uh, the time where we will be gathering together will be coming back soon. Um, so I just thank you that during uh, the time that we can't be here that your continued support has has been um, incredible, and uh, just thank you for that continued support. Um, hopefully soon we will be together. Um, it's going to be a learning curve for all of us as we uh, figure out what we need to do and the different precautions that we have when we gather together. We'll be sending out some information on that as we um, have uh, a developed plan, and that comes together um, in that time. Uh, we just, uh, again, thank you for your support. So let us continue to worship God as we give of our tithe and our offerings. Happiness, true happiness, I find in serving you. 
happiness, true happiness. I want my whole life through. Like the tree that's beside the stream, bearing fruit in its time. Not like the dust the wind blows away, your protection is all mine. Happiness, true happiness, I find in loving you, my Lord. Happiness, true happiness, I want my whole life through. my whole life through. Let us offer a prayer of dedication and a pastoral prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have uh, given to us as a gift. Uh, we thank you for the comfort and encouragement that we have in your Holy Spirit. And um, we also thank you for uh, the strength and the power and the prompting to go out and spread your, your, your message of love and grace and mercy in Christ. Um, and uh, we just pray for your protection as we go forward. So Holy Spirit, come alongside of us in this. Uh, take the gifts uh, that we have given to you this day and, and use them for your purpose. Use them for this very proclamation of, of your love um, for uh, pushing back divisions and, and bringing peace and healing and wholeness through the proclamation of, of the gospel of Jesus. Um, our God, we lift up to you our, our prayers of intercession for, for others. There are so many that are uh, in, in places where they're struggling, they're sick or ill, or um, they're uh, dealing with anxieties and worries. And so we call upon you, our God, on, on their behalf and just pray for uh, your peace to rest upon them. Um, rest your Holy Spirit upon all those uh, that are in, in those places. Uh, even right now at this very moment, may your Holy Spirit come upon them and rest upon them, um, give you your peace. Uh, may we, we know, um, and, and uh, even where, where our eyes can't see, but, but where the faith that we have in you holds us, that we know with certainty of your love for us and your promises. Um, and that so even when we uh, are faced with death, we know that you hold us in your love in Christ through eternity, and so that death is not the final answer. So may we um, go forward in encouragement and boldness, carrying out the ministry of Jesus uh, that you have placed before us. Um, and we give you thanks, God, that we are not alone in this. Uh, your Holy Spirit is there uh, as our advocate, our counselors come alongside of us. Uh, we pray for all of those who are still uh, uh, dealing with the difficulties of this pandemic, the coronavirus. And uh, we, we pray for uh, the doctors that are working on a vaccine, that that vaccine can come together. We pray for all of those who are sick right now at this moment and, and for their healing. We pray for those who are grieving uh, because they've lost loved ones uh, through this. And um, again, we just ask for your peace to be upon them. Uh, we pray for us as we move towards uh, opening our uh, economy, opening our churches, uh, that we can do so in a way that uh, uh, keeps uh, the safety uh, uh, in mind of all those who, who are there. And, uh, but we do look forward to that time and, and uh, we, we anticipate with great joy for that. But even with greater joy, we anticipate that um, coming together of all of us in, in your heavenly kingdom. And so, God, um, may this be something that uh, we as your followers, followers of Christ, um, say we see this as a great cause that we can commit our lives to, to proclaim your love and grace and, and bring your peace and healing to this broken world. We pray together as disciples of Jesus, and we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Go now, empowered by God's Holy Spirit, and be witnesses to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>